Everyone, welcome to the show. I have a special guest today. Um, you guys might recognize him. You will definitely recognize his story. He is a January 6th convict now. Um, he's got that title. This is Felipe Marquez, and uh, he is from Florida. Yes, he's a Florida man. Um, Felipe was uh, adjudicated, his case was adjudicated back early on in these cases, September of 2021. Is that correct? Um, uh, I believe um, it, that, uh, that was when you my, took the plea deal. Yeah, I took the plea in September. Sentencing was around December. Okay. And then uh, I finished my probation last year in the summer, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so Felipe was, um, he pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct in a restricted building or grounds, and he received an 18-month probationary sentence. So, you know, he was a lower-level offender. You just went in the building, walked around, and left. Um, so this is not someone who brutalized the police or damaged any property or anything. Uh, so we have been, for anybody who's watching who doesn't know, um, Felipe, I'm going to bring up the elephant in the room that you can address okay. because I'm yeah. sure it's going to come up. Felipe had made the comment that January 6th was his Rosa Parks moment. <laughs> and yeah. he has told me over in Instagram conversation that, you know, probably not one of his more wise statements <laughs> yeah not not the brightest moment it was just like the first thing that came to, to mind when uh i was walking over uh broken glass as you know i stated in the in the interrogation or interview room you know it was just mm -hmm. the first thing that uh came to mind and uh that was actually the first time i mentioned it before being interviewed by a news channel was when like the FBI was starting to interview me before the news people showed up. I kind of mentioned that it was that kind of thing as well, I believe. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and you were how old when you took part in the Capitol attack? Well, three years ago, I was 25. Okay. 25, so roughly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all say and do stupid shit in our 20s. <laughs> Yeah, I I know, you know, I got married at 26. So yeah, we do some stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I want to tell my audience, like you reached out after you found my video. And I, I've been contacted by I would say, half a dozen, maybe close to a dozen different people who found my videos of them about yeah. the January 6th attack, and you were one of the very few who was respectful and you were kind and, you know, weren't sarcastic or rude or, you know, insulting in any way. And so we have struck up, you know, conversations and we've found some common ground on you used to be vegan. I'm still yeah. vegan. Um, I think you still probably dabble in it a little bit. But I uh, just had some uh, mac and cheese that was with the Daya cheese brand. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll stock a lot of products at home that are plant-based. Yeah, yeah. And one thing you said to me on Instagram that I, I wanted to dig into was you used to be a progressive. Is that right? That is correct. Um, throughout... I for when I first got into politics around the age of 14, maybe like in high school, right? Uh I was very uh I turned to like Ron Paul, right? Very libertarian type. And then I think um when Obama won the re-election, that's when I was more of a, a Democrat, but I wasn't able to vote at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I stayed progressive. I like watched a lot of Kyle Kalinske for several years. Um, and then, um, I guess I had a couple things that made me turn conservative. Uh, and it, it was like more on the issues of abortion. Um, 
as I started to relate more with the conservative side when it comes to abortion, uh, because I was a baby that was born that was supposed to be aborted, right? Like the doctors told my parents that, you know, I was supposed to, you know, no, nah, I wasn't going to make it. And so that's one of the things that really turned me over to the conservative side. Okay. So you would say that's, that's primarily where your pro, uh, pro-life stance comes from was your own Um, story. yeah, that's, that's the main thing that personal thing that makes me more pro-life. Okay. Do you think that women should have a choice though? Or do you think that it should be mandated by the government? Um, I like Trump's stance right now where he's saying that it should be left up to the state's rights. Uh, personally, if I'm going to go with like a spiritual side, like as a believer in the Bible, you know, the Bible says that God knows you from the womb. And I do have another friend that was that came out of you know unfortunate circumstances like that and and um like i'm very uh i guess more on the extreme side when it comes to pro life i i think only uh when it's threatening the life of the mother like what do you what do you think about these cases that are going on right now where women are being denied access to help you know health wise and their their lives are being put in jeopardy there was just that woman down in georgia who died um, a couple years ago and the medical board reviewed her case and said yes it was completely preventable young mom you know left behind a, a little boy I think her son is nine years old. He's now without his mother. What do you what do you think about something like that being that the whole What reason that she died what happened? was because so um, she I, I don't know the complete backstory, but she had taken an abortion pill. For some reason, her body didn't let go of all of the tissue. So Oh. she needed a very basic procedure, which is a DNC. Uh, just to rid her body of that tissue. And because of Georgia's six week abortion ban, and because the doctors have been threatened that, you know, if you do anything that isn't because of the life of the mother, you are subject to being hit with a felony, you could go to prison. So doctors And they didn't are view that as affecting the life of the mother. That's really odd. Yeah, the, and unfortunately, this is going on a lot. Um, there have been quite a few cases now, and what we're finding out is that because it can take a couple years for these cases to get to a medical board to review, we don't even know how many women now have died or almost died because of the abortion ban that Trump helped to put in place, because um, the doctors are terrified. You know, they don't want to be put in jail. They don't want to lose Yeah, their they license. don't want to suffer the consequences Right. due to policies. Yeah, so they're allowing these women to suffer and suffer and develop sepsis throughout their body. And that's what happened with this young mother. I want to say she was 26 or 28. I mean, very young woman. And she ended up dying because they let it go too long before they decided to take her in for surgery. And And I would have a question on that is very tragic. Um, but did, did the mom or mom to be, did, was that like a product of, um, the R word or incest or I, was like it I said, a personal I, I don't decision? know. Yeah, I don't know her full backstory. So unfortunately, but you know, it's happening with other women who want their child. There was a woman down in Texas. Oh, wow. Um, she had a child or, or no, I guess this would was her going to be her first child, I believe. Married woman. They desperately wanted a baby. She was pregnant. They figured out there was an issue with the baby, that there was no way the baby was going to survive. Um, her body was rejecting the fetus. Mm -hmm. And so she started to go into sepsis. She was bleeding out. They kept refusing her 
treatment, wow. kept sending her home, and it got to the point that she almost died, and now she might not be able to have more children. Yeah, no, that's All not right. Of, yeah, so those are the, you know, the repercussions that I think the right and conservatives are not seeing, and if you're truly pro-life, then you should care about the life of the mother, too. Indeed, you know? yeah, for sure. Um, I I think that uh, my side of the aisle can turn a blind eye sometimes to things that are, you know, for the better of humanity mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. Um, and maybe it happens on both sides of the aisle where we don't see each other's like policies that may benefit overall like life, like quality of life. Mm hmm. Um, and, and in those instances where, where there's, uh, abortion that needs to be done medically for the life of the mother, and there's some sort of weird policy that's preventing, uh, the proper treatment from happening, you know, that, that needs to be addressed and it should be a, a bipartisan issue. Now, when it comes to like the majority of abortions, they're, they're done uh, from what I've heard. They're they're like ninety percent of it is you know from choice and not out of medical necessity, and that's where I have a little bit of a quarrel because of you know my my background like how I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely should be a bipartisan issue when it comes to the life of the mother. Yeah, I mean, I I just I guess I would say. Because I come from a um, kind of a unique perspective. I don't know if you watched my show, but I have a kind of a, a unique story. I was adopted. Mm -hmm. And so I think people paint this rosy picture of what adoption is. And I can tell you my life was a living hell. Um, by the time yeah. I was 12 years old, I used to think of suicide daily. Um, it was a horrific family, very violent, um, just emotionally, physically abusive in every aspect. And I, I literally used to cry and think, I wish I wasn't here. Like, why was I even born? Because this is hell on earth. Um, I also became pregnant when I was 18. Sad. And... For me, it was, you know, it was a tough decision because my boyfriend of two and a half years said, if you have this baby, we're done. So I knew I'm going to be on my own. And yeah. we, you know, we kind of went back and forth on it. And then I ended up finding him in bed with someone else when I was five months pregnant. So oh. I was on my own. Now, I couldn't bring myself to personally have an abortion, but I get why you know i i was fortunate enough even with and it might sound funny but even with as bad as my family was at least yeah. i knew they weren't going to kick me out of the house still I knew supportive I would have in a, like the slightest yeah i mean i knew i would have a roof over my head you know um i would have some sort of support but that's not always the case um i have a cousin whose wife when she was a teenager, her stepfather was raping her and he impregnated her at 15. Dear she, Lord. Yeah, she went to her mother and told her mother and her mother kicked her out of the house. Her mother took the father's side and said, well, you must have done this. You must have brought this on. This is your fault, blah, 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 blah. You need to leave. So mm -hmm. she had nowhere to go. She had no support. Um, and so... You know, I just think, I mean, we, we got to think about if we're pro-life, we got to think about the women too, you know, yeah. and what's, what was right for me or the choice I made, I don't feel I have the right to impose that on another person. Yeah. Um, and to um, me, it's like, you know, when I look at the Republicans and they're like all about, you know, oh, I should have self-determination and I should be able to do what I want and say what I want. And, you except know, for my when it comes life. to the life of an unborn child. Yeah. yeah. And so it's yeah. like, eh, I mean, if you're going to ban books and tell, you know, transgender people what they can do and can't do with their body or you want to at least, 
you can't be hypocrites about it. It's like, you Yeah, know, it's um uh cherry picking, right? yeah, yeah. Um And, and everybody's situation is different. So, you know, for me, it's like I, with my experience being adopted, there was no way in hell I was going to put my child up for adoption. Oh yeah. You know, but I became a single mother at 19 and it completely changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I love him to death, you know, but, and I've told him this, you know, nothing I had planned for my life came to pass because there's just no way you can work full time, raise a child, which is another full time job on your own, you know, and, and pursue your goals. It, no matter, you know, what anybody says, there's just not enough hours in the day, not enough energy <laughs> in a human being. So, Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, you said there were a couple of things that made you move from being a progressive to a conservative outside of the whole abortion issue. What was there something else that happened? <laughs> Um, I guess it would have to do with, um, the way that I acquired, um, my belongings and stuff like that and became, um, uh, more well off, which is, um, what, what is it? Not ironic, but a uh, different word perhaps. Um, so I used to live in my car. And I would do ride share living in my car. And um, at that point, I was still very progressive because I'm like, man, I'm struggling here. I need some help. I need some assistance programs, something, you know, get me on my feet. Um, and um, I don't know what I'm allowed to say exactly, because I ended up I had an injury. So let's just sum it up this way. I had an injury and I signed the NDA and for a settlement offer. Okay. And it was around that time that I kind of slowly started the shift towards conservative. So I was able to purchase a home, was able to purchase my car and And then um, I was, but you know, before I had received the settlement, I already my 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 mindset had already started to shift towards you know protecting my own assets, right? Uh, so it became more of like, uh, like you know, I want to pay less taxes. Um, I want to, or at least taxes that are fair. Um, and, or. Uh, I want to I want people to succeed without government assistance as to the as best as possible. I still believe there should be like a safety net of sorts. But the way that we're doing it now isn't the most practical. And we see the results of some of the assistance programs that we have. It kind of keeps people stuck in a in a cycle of poverty. um and and perhaps promotes bad behavior um personally like when i i used to like get free lunches at school right and i would always love getting the free lunches i would look forward to it um and then you know i grew up with food stamps and ebt and i don't know if it's just psychological or if it's just me but you know getting having that fallback kind of doesn't like allow you to push further sometimes like you just get complacent and then you know between family that i know or friends that i know that are also in the same boat I, you know i could see that how you know i don't want to go get a job because then i'm gonna gonna lose these these government benefits And oh, a solution that can still have a safety net, but, you know, it's different and it will encourage more work or more to the best of one's abilities is I believe it's called like a negative, negative income benefit or credit where 
where you get welfare, you receive it, but it slowly starts to shift as you earn more income. And so mm -hmm. to, to, to let you be at that level where you were receiving government assistance, but while you're still working so you could earn more. And so something like that. I think Milton Friedman goes over it in a video I saw on YouTube. Uh, Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell, I believe they talk about that form of government assistance that is allegedly better than what we have currently. What What do you think, though, about how we bail out corporations? Um. I mean... I haven't done too much research into it other than when I was, you know, watching Kyle Kalinske every day. I mean, um, I, I, I'm quite a bit older than you. Um, yeah. So I, I lived through and really felt the effects of the 2008 recession. Uh, my husband and I were both in the mortgage and real estate industry at the time, actually yeah. co-owners of a mortgage bank that we had just started. <laughs> and it just imploded. I mean, everything fell apart. And then, you know, everybody got messed up except for the corporations. Well, what we ended up finding out is it was because of the games on Wall Street, because of how they manipulated all the assets and they were literally selling um, subprime mortgages, which are very high risk. Yeah. They were bundling them. It was basically like putting, you know, a dog turd <laughs> inside of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and yeah. giving it to someone, you know, and they were selling these as they were saying, oh, yeah, all of these loans are a paper, all of these are the best, you know, totally safe, totally legitimate, and they're selling them on the market to investors. And so they were just blowing up in their faces, because yeah, these were people who you honestly couldn't, couldn't qualify for a loan. Yeah. And they were giving them to them anyway. And, you know, the banks were just flat out lying about what these assets were. So they were playing flat, fast and loose. Um, there was a lot of other stuff that went on, too, that was their fault. But they ended up getting bailed out to the tune of billions of dollars of our tax dollars. So yeah, the issue I have is that you know, people will often say, like you did, you know, oh, I just think these people are living off the government, but that's our money. That's mm -hmm. our, that, you know, those people paid into it. And, yeah. you know, for, for some people, it's temporary. I mean, most people don't enjoy just living off of, you know, what little they get from the government. It's not enough. Yeah, it's cover. not a, it's not a lavish lifestyle. No, no. And I, I think that alone, you know, would in give the incentive for a lot of people to, to go out and do more. Yeah, um, the problem right there is, is that the moment you earn, I, I believe this is the way it is, the moment you earn a dollar over what the limit is supposed to be, it kind of leaves you on a shaky balance board. It doesn't give you too much support. So you end up making a dollar more, you're sufficient enough for a month or two, but then month three, something happens and you're back on the system. Yeah, that that is true. And I, I guess my thought is always, I would rather be sure to help the children out there whose yeah. families are struggling and make sure that everybody who really is trying their hardest gets the help that they need even if it means a few unscrupulous people slip through. Yeah, and, some, you know, some people always find a way to abuse the system. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop helping, that, that we should stop helping. So, Yeah, and I guess that's yeah. my issue with the Republican Party is that they're so willing to bail out the corporations and their buddies that help to keep them. And Democrats do too. You know, there's yeah. plenty of corporate different Democrats. Areas who take that money and look the other way and let them get away with stuff. I mean, um, you know, it was Bush who, Clinton and Bush who helped to contribute to the financial collapse in 2008. And then Obama 
didn't hold them to account. You know, he didn't, he didn't prosecute them as he should have. So I can understand a lot of the anger and the angst. Um, Can you understand though, why people might hear your story and go, wow. So when you were down on your luck, you wanted help. And then as soon as you got yours, you're like, yeah, I can, everybody. I, I can, I can see how that, that can, that can seem like that. And what I would want to say is that I still support a safety net, but I want it to be, I want it to actually work. You know, I want it to actually help people instead of have them stuck somewhere. And I think that's what, you know, Milton Friedman's uh, idea on that negative cash flow system would, would completely change, uh, like, productivity when it comes to also receiving assistance for those that are able-bodied. Have you done any research or seen any of the studies that have been done on uh, UBI, the Universal Basic Income? Oh, yeah, I I really like the idea of UBI. I know a lot of people on my side are not going to like that. <laughs> but um, UBI, I think, is, is going to be inevitable. Um, and it it's... I did more research on it probably like a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't remember much. Um, but universal basic income theory is you help give people just enough sustenance. Uh, so just enough money to provide for extra things while they're still working. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a great idea. Um, help people to establish businesses, help people to just take a vacation, you know? Yeah, not even that. I, well, it's universal basic income is just across the board. So whether you're working or not, you get yeah. just, you know, whether it's $500 a month, $1,000 a month. Um, I'll be honest, when I first heard about it, I was like, eh, I don't know if, you know, this is going to work. But the more I've researched it and studied it, what they've found with all of these pilot programs that they've done here in the U.S. and in Europe is it has actually helped to not just lift people out of poverty, but it's actually given them ways to find better employment. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, there are a lot of people in these studies who, because they're on, they're a paycheck employee and they're working an hourly job, they couldn't take off an hour or two to go on an interview to yeah. go get a better job, better paying job. So they were literally just stuck where they I were. I completely feel that right now. Yeah. Completely and so, feel that. you know, even just giving them $500 a month gave them the opportunity to take some days off per month without putting them at risk of losing their apartment or, you know, not being able to feed their family. And they were actually go able to go out and get better employment and became an even more productive member of society, um, yeah. you know, or, or they were able to get a, a suit to go on interviews, you know, or yeah. a dress that, you know, or there were some people who were homeless, even though they were working, but they couldn't afford an apartment. And it was, it gave them the ability to, you know, make a down payment, get an apartment so that they could shower every night and then go on interviews and, so, yeah, yeah I, I I think one of the questions that people on my side of the aisle are going to have are like the logistics between the distribution of the money and how much we can afford. And my rebuttal to my to my own side of the aisle would be um, the way that we're distributing money right now. I think 70% of it, 75% of all federal funding goes into like social programs. So instead of having all the different types of programs, it could be cut in that area to afford a UBI overall. So that's one thing to like mm -hmm. look over. Um, I really like Thomas Sowell when it comes to uh, like economic viewpoints 
Um, and if if we could get Thomas Sowell on a study of UBI, that that would be that that would really open up the doors for for dialogue. Mm. Yeah, I I mean I just think that we you know we give too much of our hard and earn money to the uh, military industrial complex and I think uh, defense spending is thirty percent of the entire federal budget. Yeah, I could be wrong. It's just massive. It's just massive, and yeah, it, there there's no common sense in government. That's my issue. Is <laughs> and yeah. that and that's across the board. It's like. There's so few people at the top who are, you know, just m using common sense and, yeah. you know, care to sit down and, and yeah, there, there is some fat in there here and there. And you I, know, I think what happens trimmed, is, but... is uh, it, when I was reading, ba I think it was basic economics by Thomas Sowell. What happens is that each branch of government and each new program that's created now, once it's created, now it has its own self-interest. Mm -hmm. And so let's say that, uh, I guess in theory, right, the Department of Food Stamps, the people who work in that department want to keep their jobs. So they want more people on food stamps, right, right. per se. And that, that could happen across any sort of federal program for mm -hmm. any uh, any purpose, right, any motivation, whether it's to help out a corporation or to help out an individual, that department who's giving the funding or setting up the programs has now their own interest and it needs to self-propagate to keep its interests. And that's yeah. where we have this unbalance of funding, unbalance of power. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so let's switch gears, go back to... January 6th. Yeah. Why did you go to the Capitol that day? So I had a lot of feelings um, coming from the facts over feelings side. I had a lot of feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was at a time where I thought the nuclear family, right, was under attack per se. And that somehow, you know, uh, uh, Trump was like the champion of like the family and, or the conservatives were like the champions of family structure and or morals and stuff. And I, although I grew up like listening to lots of hip hop and rap, was, uh, being around different cultures, uh, exposed to a lot of degeneracy per se through the music I love to listen to. Mm -hmm. Um and and then i could i could see as i got a little older right to the ages of 24 25 uh that it 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 seemed like in my echo chamber that the whole family unit is being attacked by um music or movies that promote uh, different types of family structures or promote very, uh, in Spanish, we say libertinaje or too much liberty, like excess liberty. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the song WAP had came out a few months before January 6th, like half a year. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> and I also watched a lot of videos about human trafficking uh, beforehand, like even as a liberal human trafficking was still something that was big on my list uh -huh. of of reasons. As it should uh, be with everyone. Yeah. 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 And the right really started pushing, um, you know, that, hey, this is a really big issue. And, um, you know, if we don't win there's there's it's, it's game over for the family unit it's it's free reign for the traffickers and it's you know and and honestly i don't know if i was now looking back at it now that we've given it like three years i i don't know i'm still like a little confused because it seems like yeah there's a lot some merit to the trafficking claim 
but whether it's coming from a political aisle or just independent actors is is the real question so yeah. it's not really just a democrat or a republican it's individual people from all sides it could be anybody yeah because there were there were quite a few pedophiles in the crowd that day at the capitol i've, I've covered yeah. their their cases um pretty I sick one, one that was screaming at the cops telling them that they were protecting pedophiles and then come to find out guy Definition had actually of irony. gone to <laughs> gone to prison for yeah having sex with i think it was a 14 year old when he was 25 so yeah um it, in that vein what do you think about donald trump's relationship with jeffrey epstein that's a good question i did try looking into that um because of the pictures right there's pictures of trump with epstein and video and yeah. and video okay. yeah. i haven't seen video but i definitely seen the oh, yeah. pictures He's doing the white man overbite oh <laughs> or, uh, yeah it was a <laughs> it was a party at, at mar-a-lago and jeffrey yeah. epstein was there and they were it was like them and just all women yeah and, uh, allegedly from what i heard um that trump said that he disassociated himself from that after he found out about the island or found out more about Jeffrey Epstein's character allegedly he distanced himself from that individual from Epstein so I don't know the whole truth to it um I'm still crossing my fingers hoping that I can get a pardon if Trump wins office right <laughs> <laughs> um so are you aware of the woman who came forward and accused Trump of raping her at Jeffrey Epstein's New York wow. mansion? Wow. No, I'm not aware of that, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely a... look into it. So she filed um, she filed three suits um, over the course of, I think it was a year. This was in uh, 2016. The beginning of 2016, she filed a lawsuit by herself Wow. Obviously not knowing what she was doing, she filed it incorrectly. So she went and found a, a friend of hers who, again, didn't know what he was doing. He is a patent attorney, so he didn't understand how the laws work with this kind of stuff. He filed it. The court said, you know, this, you, this isn't right. You can't file it this way. Um, because of the statute of limitations, she couldn't go after him to, like, on a I am in, cr in a criminal way yeah. to put him in prison. And so the, the court was like, no, this isn't going to fly. This passed the statute of limitations. You can only go after him financially, unfortunately, in a, in a oh, civil so matter. Like a statute of limitations of like seven years or something like that. Um, I, I'm, I don't remember what it is for child rape, um, but it's not very long. I mean, I want to say it's maybe a couple of years. So unfortunately, so um, she hired an attorney who I actually know, okay. uh, Lisa Bloom. She's a fellow vegan. Um, she's done a lot of work in the vegan community for free. Um, she's, you know, pretty well known. Her mother's Gloria Allred, the high powered attorney. So I actually, when that lawsuit came out, I want to say it was. Uh, when she finally filed the third one with Lisa Bloom, I think it was October or something. So it was right mm -hmm. before the election. So of course, everybody's, oh yeah, it's only because of the election and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. My thing is, if you were abused as a child and you saw the man who, because she claims that, and, and you can go look up her lawsuit because it's still yeah. out there on the internet. What's um, her name? Um, well, you know, they said Jane Doe, but she goes, what was the name that she goes by? It's, it's a pseudonym. Um, but if you put in Trump Epstein scribed, S-C-R-I-B-D, that's where a lot of lawsuits are, the filings are housed. Um, you should be able to find it. I found law and crime. A law and crime um, for the 2016. So it went all the way back in 2016, right? Yeah, that's when she filed all three. Wow. Um, trying to think of her actual the name. She doesn't want to she... be named in the article, so yeah, she did I a could video. Understand that, yeah. She did a video in um, 
incognito, <laughs> you know, she was, she had on a disguise, but um, I, I can't think, Katie Johnson, that's what she ended up calling herself, even though that's not her real name either. Yeah. But um, yeah, she claims that Trump beat her, tied her to a bed and raped her when she was 13 years old. And um, then he threatened her that if she told anybody, he would come after her and her family. So the thing is, I spoke with Lisa Bloom um, when I, I ran into her at a vegan event in December, beginning of December 2016. They had just dropped the case. Um, and she, I went up to her and asked her, you know, why and was it possible that she was going to file again? She said, no, she is so terrified. I guess she got so many death threats and they were threatening her family because people did end up finding out who she was. Um, she was just too terrified to go with, through with it. So. Yeah, that's something that's very, it, it leaves me, for example, somebody who wants Trump to win with like a moral debacle. Like, is this reality or is this, you know, made up? And, and it, it leaves me like questioning, basically. Yeah. And I, I would ask too, like, what, what do you think about, you know, because you, you obviously care about family and the family unit and, you know, morals and, and you know, conservative values. Um, I mean, he's cheated on every wife he's had. You know? Right. I heard I heard about that. I had, um, I believe, uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, mm -hmm. uh, come to my home and like interview me for her documentary. Yeah, I watched it. Yeah. For anybody yeah. watching this interview, by the way, uh, Felipe was in that documentary. It's called The Insurrectionist Next Door. So you can check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So and... she, did she ask you about that, too? Yeah, that's that's one thing where I didn't know. You know, I didn't know that um, you know, Trump is, you know, on his third wife and and um, you know, has done some wrong things in the past. Now, like as somebody who believes in the Bible, you know, uh, almost everybody who's a Christian has done wrong things, right? Or every anybody who's alive has done wrong things. And um and this one bit from the the Tuttle Twins, uh, which is like a, a cartoon show for kids made by, you know, conservative voices. Mm -hmm. And they they put in an example of Martin Luther King. So here we go again with another Martin Luther King con comparison <laughs> <laughs> um, that a Martin Luther King was with, I believe, prostitutes or something like that. And, you know, people are not perfect. Right. So they they do wrong things. But some some of the things that they can do can benefit our fabric of society, you know, like judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Although MLK had, you know, inappropriate relations, uh, he did champion civil rights. He Yeah, he did cheat on his wife. And yeah, I I. I do fault him for that and yeah he had good qualities as well um what would you say about all the people that trump has screwed over in business you know um, so many business people that have come out and said contractors like he refused to pay people or he would you know threaten them yeah, oh you know i'm, I'm you know, very I'm give you a fraction of that you know very ignorant of the of, of the issue when it comes to Trump's businesses. Uh, and, and if that's, you know, if that's the case, I would say that, you know, it's unfair. Um, but yeah, I mean, one man not knowing it, suicide. You know. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, he actually destroyed this man's life. The, the man had done months and months of work for him. And then Trump just refused to pay him after it. Like he, this was a kind of a pattern with him not kind of, it was a pattern. Uh, Michael Cohen wrote about it in his book, Disloyal, about how he was the one, like he was Trump's attack dog. He would go and threaten these people on Trump's behalf 
and tell them, well, Trump is not happy with the job you oh, did. He felt like you know. a hypocrite is what we're getting at type of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, he, he at, at the time, he was very, Michael Cohen, I mean, was very taken in by Trump's celebrity and, you know, he was very impressed by him. But after Trump basically tried to throw him under the bus, um, you know, with a lot of things, uh, and then he was going to end up taking the fall for the whole Stormy Daniels thing and oh, wow. paying money to her, then he was like, okay, I got to protect myself and my family. I got to start telling the truth. So that's when he went to Congress and said, here's what actually went down. Trump knew that, you know, this story of him sleeping with Stormy Daniels coming out right before the election was going to be really bad for him because the Access Hollywood tape had already come out with him saying, grab him by the pussy. And, you know, I don't even wait. I just grab women. I just start kissing, you know. Um, so they were trying to quash that story. And so that's why Michael Cohen took out a home loan, took out a home equity loan yeah. to pay off Stormy Daniels. Wow, that's, I, I don't know the full story about the Stormy Daniels situation other than, you know, was, you know, basically uh, an actress that uh, Trump had allegedly slept with or something. Yeah, I mean, she was, um, she was a porn actress and she, he slept with her right after Barron was born and Melania was still home breastfeeding. Wow. Yeah. yeah and and right. I mean, it was proven in court. So, you know, even the, his the friends. The sins of man. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, by all accounts, you know, to me, you make a mistake once, you it's, apologize. Yeah. Okay. Have to do it three times Maybe over. Maybe even twice. <laughs> But when you keep doing it, you know, and then it came out through the Stormy Daniels story that he also had a, I think it was a nine or 10 month affair with a Playboy playmate named Karen McDougal. So he paid her off as well during the, during the campaign. So her story wouldn't come out. Um, and some of his friends actually testified at the trial, uh, David Pecker who was the head of um, AMI, which was from, you know, the National Enquirer. He, he sat on the witness stand. And he said, you know, I, I love Donald. I still think that he's a great man, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, well, he this told, is the truth of what happened. Yeah, this is how it went down. And yes, Michael paid me, but it was at the direction of, of Trump. Yeah, so, I, I think I might have that kind of same sentiment. Um, when it comes to the president, because, uh, you know, or to Trump, the 45th president, mm -hmm. um, like, I'm just hoping, right, fingers crossed, that he feels remorseful about a lot of the things, even though, you know, it, it's hard for somebody in that running for presidency to come out and just admit to every single wrongdoing they've ever done. It's it's not a good look for campaigning, so I could understand why Trump wouldn't want to come out and start saying, apologizing, and things like that. Like, it's like a 50-50, like, should you? Yes, right? Does it benefit? Would it hurt? It would might hurt more. So I guess it's like a, a, a strategy to keep supporters like myself, right, away mm -hmm. from those types of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, because it does where, make it does make you question, you know. Yeah, where do you get your news? Because I'm I'm um, curious, like how you haven't heard all of this. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I I kept away from politics for for a while. Um, mm -hmm. now because I'm trying to build my like my music career type of stuff and artist type of things, I'm making animations and I'm trying to use any avenue I can to, to build up my online presence. Um, and so I started getting into politics more recently, mm -hmm. uh, at least more publicly. And I normally either watch Fox or I'll get my news online from like a Google search for whatever is happening that day. I'll get 
notifications from X about different things. Um, so social media mainly is where I'm getting most of my information. Now, the bad part about that is that there's a there's a statistic going around, I believe, that says that fake news travels five times faster than real news. So that can be uh, an issue. It's something that I've started to like double check and triple check things before I start believing them wholeheartedly from a simple X post. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and two, because of the algorithms. I mean, whatever you show interest in and click on or- It's going to give you, you know, more of it. Right, you're just going to get more of that. And so that's how we get siloed into our little bubbles. And the left does it too, you know? Yeah. I, I find I, that people- I only had a liberal watch... bubble before and all I saw was vegan content and Kyle Kalinske in my scroll yeah. feed all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend uh, the show Breaking Points. I think I may have mentioned it to you before, but the um, the female host is Crystal Ball. She is a progressive. She's actually married now to Kyle Kalinske. And then the male host is a, he voted for Trump. He is a conservative, um, more so a new age kind of uh, more populist type of conservative. So actually one of his good friends is JD Vance. Oh, so wow. you get both perspectives and a lot of, you know, where, where people can find common ground. Oh, I like how they did that with the red and the blue logo mm -hmm. together and they yeah. split it in half. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then on uh, Wednesday each week, so they do Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and then on Wednesday and sometimes on Friday, it's um, Emily Zizinski, who's a real conservative, pro-life, you know, very conservative woman, and then um, uh, Ryan, Ryan Grimm, who used to be with The Intercept, so a progressive. But, and you get a nice balance, a nice mix. Yeah. Yeah, and I I watch and listen to everything, but I I watch or at least listen to their show, you know, podcast form every single day, because I don't like being siloed. I don't like, <laughs> you know, only hearing one side because, yeah, it it you know you are going to end up biased and you aren't going to know fully what's going on. Um, so I I like to get my news. I mean I I, you know, get. Epoch Times in my inbox every yeah, day, yeah. you know, along <laughs> with everything else. I mean, I, I look at just about everything that's out there so that I know what's going on. But um, yeah, I recently um, subscribed to Ground News, mm -hmm. uh, their subscription, and they have their website where you can see, you know, what uh, news outlets are covering which stories. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very interesting to use their website. Um, yeah. I do have an idea that I want to develop. I'm working on creating a website where people can get information about their local candidates quickly, efficiently. Mm -hmm. And because, um, you know, for the times that I voted in my life, which is probably like three to four times now, and I'm 28 now. So um, I, I struggled to like know who who's who on the ballot right and what they represent what they stand for yeah. so the goal of the website i'm making is to make it easy for somebody who's last minute at the voting booth or even before in preparation mm -hmm. to know what policies any any of the candidates on the paper stand for yeah that's a great idea yeah, because too many people, I think, and I used to do this too, so I'm not slamming anybody for it. Um, but I think, you know, when you're busy and you're working, you're taking care of kids and you got a household to take care of. I mean, yeah, you just grab people... the little pamphlet and then you vote for these people. Yeah, I mean, you, you go off of vibes and who you like and who you'd rather, you know, have a coffee with or a beer or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think people need to be more educated on it. But yeah, any anything that makes that easier, I'm all for it. Yeah, now, I'm currently working on it and crossing my fingers, mm -hmm. hopefully it's going to be good. Yeah, well, let me know. I, I'll 
be happy to spread the word for you. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a lot of things that got you to the Capitol. Did you think that the, the election had been stolen? Was that a part of your belief um, system at that day and I why think, you went? I think uh, a lot of people, like everybody there thought the election was stolen. Uh, but the more concerning part would be the mob mentality and how everybody who who thinks that the election was stolen also had different motivations for being there. Like for myself, it was because I believed the family unit was under attack, you know, and in conjunction with thinking the election had been stolen. And that's, you know, uh, a saddening thing to to see or to experience or to feel mm -hmm. uh like losing trust in you know the government is 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 a is a horrible feeling it's a horrible feeling and i think just about everybody experiences it in one degree or another when mm -hmm. you know going through the DMV, or whether it's they need this life-saving medication and their insurance is not covering it, you know. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's a huge problem. And I think for the people who want to get away from, you know, the extremes, whether it be on the left or the right, I think people need to come to the understanding that, yeah, we need to restore faith in our government and our elected leaders and get rid of like stock trading among our insider election. trading you know? yeah exactly because I, and i made this case the other day on my show that i i think it's even going to harm our national security because we are seeing and i just saw another article about it a few days ago how the military is having trouble getting people to enlist because yeah. you know when people have lost faith and they don't feel like the government is doing anything for me why am I going to stand up for the country? Yeah, the country I, isn't going to stand up for me. I'm not standing up for it. I remember seeing a few videos that expressed that sentiment from uh, people who are more extreme uh, YouTubers, like, and they would say things like that. That were, you know, why would I fight for? for a country when men's rights are being violated, for example. Some people feeling that men are underrepresented or under uh, cared for, not as cared for as um, in the family court system, for example. Um, and, you know, there's different reasons people can give to feel that distrust of government. Um and that 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 impacts our morale as a nation and i mean some are kind of yeah. like i mean the the whole you know men aren't are getting the short end of the stick kind of thing <laughs> doesn't really fly with me considering that men yeah. have gotten away with so much for decades and centuries yeah. and you know it's kind of like Oh, now that women are starting to just maybe <laughs> be making a little bit of, you know, <laughs> inroads yeah. and, and getting some some equal treatment here and there, you know. Yeah, but, I not that I agree with most of, you know, what is said, because um, that person that I'm referencing in particular is a little bit more on the extreme side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I. Yeah heard of some of the men like that making those cases and it's like yeah they're they're just not wanting to give up the the number one status that they've held for many many centuries yeah <laughs> but, i i firmly believe in merit you know you can yeah. you you work for what you get regardless of your gender or any other identifications mm -hmm. and you're able to succeed and that's the greatest thing that we can offer in this nation is being able to succeed off your merit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more referring to the, the like tried and true real things. Like I was saying, like, you know, corporations getting bailed out when oh, the yeah, average that's... American is just thrown to yeah. the side. Yeah, that's you more know? of a aristocracy than a meritocracy. Right. Right. 
Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of people like Kyle Kalinske call it corporate welfare, you know, where the government is only oh, oh so happy to step up and bail out corporations. But yet when it comes to average Americans and, and workers and people who are just trying to get by, it's like, eh, big middle finger, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that that's the kind of stuff that I think the majority of Americans, whether right, left or center, can agree this has got to stop. We've got to stop, you know, even with the appearance of impropriety among members of Congress with the, you know, insider trading. And, it, you know, I think it's ridiculous that they get paid for the rest of their lives if they can secure three terms or two terms or three terms in Congress. It's like, no, I mean, any other job, if you quit or you get fired, your your paycheck is gone. You got to yeah, go get another job. I, I didn't know that. If you were able to secure a certain number of terms as a career politician, you get you get a stipend for the rest of your life or something. For the like? rest of their life, they get their full salary of I want to say it's a hundred seventy eight thousand dollars a year now. Well, it looks like I should Congress. go be a politician or something. Yeah, <laughs> that that's a member of the House, and then the senators get even more. Wow. And so yeah, I want to say, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm out of my brain is fading right now, but yeah, it's either two two terms or three terms. I think it's three um, that you have to win back to back, which is why you know what's pissing me off right now is Lauren Boebert <laughs> is going to be living off of our taxpayer dime for the I, I rest don't of know her who life that is, but, if uh... she if she wins in November, <laughs> and it's like. <sighs> yeah, that's that's a, a feeling that that when, when you get when um, that anyone would get when when they work hard and they see their 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 dollars going to something that they don't agree with you know yeah yeah, yeah. i just i mean well and it's i think it's even more irritating because they're the ones who make the rules so it's like, you know, it's not even someone else making the rules for them. It's not rules like for thee, but not for me. Yeah. I mean, none of, we didn't vote on this. Not, the American people didn't vote on that and say, oh, yes, you should get paid for the rest of your life, even if you lose. You know, it, they're the ones who decided that they're going to make it that way. So and they vote on their raises you know <laughs> so yeah, like the self-propagation of the self-interest of different governments and that the now now i can see how that applies as well to politicians after mentioning after you mentioned they that they can get paid a salary forever well not um, only that too they get their health insurance benefits so they get those sweet you know primo top of the line health insurance benefits for the rest of their life i i think that is absolute insanity yeah it's a little unfair when we have people who are working really hard to make ends meet and uh, you know they work one two three jobs and they mm -hmm. still can't afford that medical insurance bill because it's like four hundred dollars for yeah. for like a family of two or one or three it's difficult yeah, yeah. well and if you're self-employed i mean it's thousands of dollars a month for a family just not you know not even counting the co-pays the deductibles just the premium yeah just month. the monthly membership yeah so you know again, i had an those... idea about uh health health insurance when it comes to um the way that the affordable care act is mm -hmm. um i think this is a, just a theory I don't know too much, but this is just what I'm assuming is that because the Affordable Care Act covers the payment for health insurance, it forces people to in to use the Affordable Care Act in order to to get health insurance like I'm using it right now. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and I see that it covers a large portion of the bill at like ridiculously large amount of money. And I'm um, I'm theorizing that if there was no Affordable Care Act, then health insurance companies could would have to be forced to lower their prices to acquire customers. Uh, eh. you, you, would, you would think, but I I've lived through no ACA. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived without Obamacare. Uh, oh. No, it was way more expensive, actually, 
and mm -hmm. the there's the reason for it. So, and and with Obamacare, with the ACA, it's based on your income. So mm -hmm. depending on how much you make. So if, like I have a friend who, because, you know, real estate is just dead right now, or it, or it was before the interest rates dropped, he yeah. literally had no income coming in. Like he was living off of his savings because everything <laughs> dried up. Nobody was doing, you know, he works in mortgages. So nobody was refinancing nobody was buying, you know, so off market. Yeah. So for him, yeah, his premium monthly was covered. Um, and then, you know, as you make more money that goes down and you have to pay more. So, yeah. you know, there is a sliding scale there. Um, I do. I do like that about the affordable care act. Yeah, I just, no, I just so theorized that maybe it wouldn't be a $400 you know, payment that the government is paying on my behalf if there if it didn't exist in the first place. But yeah, no, I, I the could be wrong. reason here's why it's so why it's affordable, why it is literally the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. because everybody's now pooled together. And this is one of the things that came up last night in the vice presidential debate, because the Republicans want to do away with the Affordable Care Act. And J.D. Vance was more recently um, in an interview recorded saying that he wants to pool people together based on their level of health. Well, that's well, the, the way thing. that's the basically the way it was before. I'm just um, rebranding it. Well, no, what it does is part of the Affordable Care Act put into place. Um, um, basically, it or took away the ability for insurance companies to penalize then, you for having health issues yeah the so, denying brace on prior health issues right yeah like for example um when i was younger i before i went vegan i used to struggle with very severe allergies and asthma mm -hmm. had never been hospitalized for it but every once in a while i would need an inhaler um, i had done allergy shots which mm -hmm. were totally ineffective <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I, did, I did allergy yeah, shots as well for like about a year yeah, I did it for years and did not help me. Could not even hug anyone who had an animal or I would be violently ill. I would get a sinus infection. I would be down for weeks. Went vegan, you know, totally off subject, but went vegan. I now, you know, and then I had a house full of animals, three cats and two dogs, totally fine. Mm -hmm. So go vegan, That's everyone. Good. Anyway. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I, when I was a vegan, for for those four years, um, I still might had a really good friend. He had cats, and I'd I'd still get very snuff stuffy. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on what you're eating. It it's all about um, internal inflammation. It's all about balancing your microbiome. So whole whole science thing but yeah. <laughs> yeah you know if you're eating a lot of processed stuff there's still a lot of oils you're still going to get inflammation and you know so uh, but we can talk about that on instagram <laughs> <laughs> but anyway years ago before the affordable care act my premium was always jacked up by the insurance companies by like 20 25 percent simply because i had allergies and asthma so whatever, you know, the baseline was, I was paying 20, 25% more. Yeah, it's definitely um, unfair. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, w women with breast implants, which I have, you automatically would get hit with an increase in premium because, you know, some women years ago when they had silicone implants, there was a high mm -hmm. propensity of, of um, breast cancer. Yeah, I have to and, tell uh, my, my mom about that then. Yeah, yeah, so Obamacare got rid of all of that. So the insurance companies are now required to take everyone regardless of their health issues. So if we got rid of Obamacare, that would all come back. So people who had cancer could be denied coverage completely. People who had previous heart attack could be denied coverage. So as much as I think Obamacare is nowhere near what, what we it needs need to and be. what we should have it did do a lot of good things it, it did help a lot of people perhaps so. um vance and trump uh are just wanting to rebrand 
the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, like I said, J.D. Vance talking about, oh, we should pool people together based on their risk. Well, that's what we had before. <laughs> that's basically what it was before Obamacare, and it sucked, and people were denied coverage. So, and I used to actually work for a medical management company. We had some clients, like our clients were health insurance companies. So we did like pre, like if you had to go get a surgery and you had to call to get the approval, like that's what our company did. Our, we had doctors and nurses who would approve the surgery as yes, this is medically necessary or no, this isn't really necessary. You, you got to pay for it out of pocket, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm we would have clients who would call up in tears because they lost their insurance because, wow. and they were like right in the middle of like treatment for leukemia and the insurance company decided, Oh, you're too much of a risk. And these bills, I mean, I had, I, I was in a department where we negotiated medical bills down. Like if people went outside of their network, yeah, we would call the provider and negotiate it and see if we could get them a discount. And uh, we would have people, you know, so upset because right in the middle of their treatment, which is like $100,000 a month for their cancer treatment, and yeah. the insurance company would drop them. So under Obamacare, they are not legally allowed to do that. So as, as much as it, you know, is not great and not what I would want, it, it definitely has protected a lot of people. Yeah. That would be even worse without it. But, you yeah, know, if you look I, at um, other countries, you know, I, mm -hmm. I actually, um, we took in two girls from Japan. Um, they were here just with their mother. Their whole family was back there. Long story short, she was a drug addict. We took them in and became their guardians. Mm -hmm. And so they have you know, all of their family back there in Japan has universal health care. It's just, you know, government run health care. They get the best care that you've ever seen. Like their grandfather was in the hospital, no joke, for like yeah. two years. Wow. Um, because And they, they kept him there because his wife is elderly and she couldn't take care of him. Mm. So the government just picked up the whole tab, took care of him that whole time until awesome. he passed away not a dime to the family you know over here we've got people filing bankruptcy left and right because of their because medical, of medical bills, bills. Yeah. yeah so um, that's the kind of stuff that yeah. makes me a progressive that keeps me progressive i can because... i can definitely feel that and i apologize for interrupting there no, it's okay Go ahead. um the the art i guess the question that would come from my side of the aisle would be the logistics issue again with like how many people we have like Japan being a smaller country or other countries that offer universal services mm -hmm. versus the, the hundreds of millions of people we have here. Yeah. And you know, my, my thought is yes, they are a smaller country. They also have a much smaller GDP They're You know, we are the okay. wealthiest nation on the planet. True, true. You know, and again, we're spending so much. We give so much to the Defense Department. We we bail out all of these corporations all the time. I mean, we always have the money, it seems. <laughs> when it comes to, help. to war. Yeah, when it comes to war, when it comes to kill. I, I, my saying is, you know, we always have money to kill people, but we never have money to save people. And okay. that has to change. We have to shift that thinking, in my opinion, in this country. Yeah. So, because again, it comes down to, you know, people are looking at this and going, you know, I can't afford health insurance. I can't afford my copay or I can't afford my medication. And yet you had all these people in the 2008 recession that got bailed out to the tune of billions of dollars for an issue they created. And then, a, and they didn't even put any restrictions in place. That's what really pissed people off because a bunch of those CEOs who were in trouble and who could have faced liability criminal and, charges. and criminal charges, yeah, they ended up getting golden parachutes and walking away with millions, and I'm talking tens of millions of dollars in a, a retirement fund and just sailed off into the sunset. 
And so that's why the, that's what the whole Occupy Wall Street thing sprung up out of, because they were like, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, our billions of tax dollars just bailed out these companies because they were, quote unquote, too big to fail. Yeah. And, you know, at the very least, Bush should have said, OK, we will bail out your company but you are going to reduce your salaries. You're going to, you know, take X amount only. You're going to do this. You're going to, I mean, there were no stipulations put in place and they made out like bandits. It's like a free pass. Yeah. Yeah. And they walked off into the sunset with literally some of them, tens of millions of dollars of U S tax dollars. And while millions of Americans lost their homes as a result of their negligence, of their criminal activity. So, yeah, we, we got to get right <laughs> with the American <laughs> people for many, many reasons. But, you know, the people who want to get rid of Trump, if you want to really, if you really dislike Trump and you don't want another Trump figure, you know. Um, dialogue, you know, lots of dialogue. Yeah, that and we need to we need to hold everybody accountable on both sides of the aisle. You know, we, we should have said, no, Obama, you are going to prosecute. You are going to tell your DOJ you go after these people, you know, so it, it won't come up again in the future, because I think um, we there's some parallels to um, perhaps foreign aid is that that my side of the aisle always likes to say we're giving you know billions of dollars in 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 war for funding you know ukraine and you know what's going on with our our veterans here or people who are struggling here and we give funding to you know the asylum immigrants i believe from haiti that are coming right and, and we help them out here uh but then our own citizens right Something like that is what I'm hearing from yeah, my side of the aisle. I, I mean, here's the thing. With Ukraine, I, I look at that much differently than I do the Israel conflict because, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they were both attacked. Um, mm -hmm. But Israel, we are giving them, you know, newer methods newer. to murder, slaughter. You know, now I think it's up to, what, tens of thousands, you know, 40 50,000, maybe even, I've heard some estimates, over 100,000 Palestinians. Um, I think they've they've just taken it too far and gone out, you know, they're hurting the wrong people. I have no problem with them going after the terrorists. Do yeah, whatever you want to them. It's the civilian casualties that yeah. are, that, murdering, that should be a concern for everybody. Murdering children and babies. I mean, just no, no. N not with my tax dollars. I don't want that. Um, with Ukraine, I, it's a little bit different because I look at it as, okay, Russia had no, no reason for invading other than they want the country. And if yeah. they're not stopped, if they're told, if they're, you know, given the lesson that, okay, we're going to let you get away with this, the next move is going to be into Poland. Yeah. And unfortunately, Poland is one of our NATO allies, which means that we will then have, have to, to put get boots in, on the ground. Yeah, we'll have to get involved at that point. Yeah. So I, I would like to see a prevention of that. And what we're giving a, a lot of what we've given to Ukraine, not necessarily all of it, it's not money. We're giving them older weapons, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of older defensive weapons that were kind of outdated and we weren't using them anyway. Yeah. So it's not like we're just handing them cash. That you know? makes sense. Um, and, and again, it, in the long term, I think it will prevent us having to send our men and women over there to fight and die, you know? So yeah, I, I do see that. Preventing war is, is critical. Yeah, I do see that a little different. Um, but yeah, I, I just think with, you know, the Haitian immigrants, with a lot mm -hmm. of the immigrants, we have to look at the bigger picture, too. I mean, even though the Ohio Republican representatives, the officials have said they've stimulated the, the economy. So okay. the, the economy was really dying over there. And, you know, they came because there was a lack of workers. 
And that makes so, sense. Yeah. you know, they, they're now buying goods from other companies. They're now paying, you know, people talk about, oh, they're taking, they're taking, but they're paying taxes and they're never going to benefit for, you know, they're not going to get Medicare, yeah, would, Medicare. It, yeah, it would take a while yeah. for them to get that path to citizenship to be able to get the full benefits. Yeah. I mean, so many, so many people, whether they, and I want people to come here legally, but I mean, let's face it, our system is just fucked. I mean, yeah. it, it takes how many years for people to seven, get citizenship? Seven years. Yeah, if you're lucky. I mean, there's some that yeah. it's even longer. And so it's ridiculous how long it takes. And in that time, they're paying into the system. I mean, in a lot of ways, they're propping up our social security for us yeah. because they're not going to collect it. You know, if they don't become citizens, they're never going to collect social yeah. security. They're Doing a lot of ride share, I, uh, I meet a lot of people. And, um, you know, the, I have people who say that you know, they come here and they work and then they they send the money back home or they're just working enough just to go back to their home country. So, you know, seeing seeing that, right, and so I, I'm not seeing that passenger that I have as somebody who's leeching off the system because they're actually working and, you know, they're, you know, they're doing what they want with the funds, right? Yeah. So... Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, as long as they're paying their taxes and, you know, and they're not committing crimes, if they're helping to revive areas like Springfield, Ohio, you know, I, I yeah. don't have a problem with that. Oh, your dog just busted in again. <laughs> <laughs> He's fine if you want to let him stay. <laughs> <don't think> <laughs> You know, I was going to ask you about that too, and I I don't want to get you know too much into detail. Um, hey, boo -boo. I'm doing an interview right now. Hi. <laughs> That's my wife. Yeah. So um, I know you know she doesn't want to be included <laughs> in no, the she minds. in the interview. She okay, minds. I was going to ask you because you are obviously married to a, a beautiful black woman. Um, how do you feel about? the lies that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have been telling about Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, because to me, it's it's mm -hmm. it's really put a target on the back of all black people because a lot of racists aren't distinguishing <laughs> between, you know, it's like it's not like yeah. you can look at someone and know that they're Haitian, <laughs> um, you know. Um, so like I, I speak a little bit of Creole. Right, I can like muy pare creo tu petit, creo mm -hmm. I see tu petit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, muy manje grillo, muy buen dro, right? I could speak in Creole just a little bit. Yeah, my my best and, friends are are Haitian. Mm -hmm. They they moved to New York from Haiti from Haiti and then came to California. But yeah, I I tell them I speak Creole too. I juji juji. That's my version. <laughs> Because they'll try to speak Haitian in front of me. I'm like, don't don't start with the juji juji in front of me. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Um, I would say that um, the whole cats and dogs thing, right, is what I'm hearing a lot. Um, trying to take a more nuanced perspective on it because I don't believe there's out of the let's say a hundred thousand, I would say like nine hundred and ninety. Eight, you know, nine hundred ninety nine thousand is is or is not gonna be eating cats and dogs, right? There might well, be one instance, but it's well, not reported. There's no police report. You know, there's no really evidence. For, well, yeah, I mean, it was actually that, proven yeah. that there's there were none. Like there was one woman who um, apparently was caught on video stomping on a a cat. And, and she was she a, an American it. citizen. Yeah, she's an American citizen. And then the other lady who went to the police and filed a report, she ended up having to admit, and she's on in a news report, um, her cat is Miss Sassy. <laughs> <laughs> and she had to admit that, yeah, I found my cat in the basement like five days later. <laughs> so yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, it is funny, but, it, you know, it's not because, I mean, it's terrorizing the community. True. And yeah, it's, it's making and... making people racist, 
pretty much yeah in, i don't in know like making inciting racist, but i think it's yeah inciting what's already there i mean like how racist how crazy do you have to be to like your cat's missing and you automatically go to oh it must have been a, a black person next door that ate it i mean my first thought would be like okay my cat got out and a coyote got it or it got yeah. run over by a car or a dog got it you know or mm -hmm. it's just out you know doing whatever cats do i mean my it would, <laughs> my neighbor eating it would not be in like my top hundred <laughs> not, not or thousand <laughs> no not the first thought up there <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, um, so with with Trump and Vance pushing the cats and the dogs, I, I would say it's more of like a like a gimmick type of thing to like maybe um, what's it called? Pandering mm -hmm. right to my side of the aisle just to give more reasons. Uh, I watch uh, a lot of Hodge twins and they they've been mm -hmm. making fun of that whole situation for the past. Um, so the Hodge twins is like a conservative, you know, yeah, I've YouTube. seen them. They're two two black guys yeah yeah and um so he they like mention how there's it's probably going on like maybe like one out of a million out of like one out of the hundred thousand because of the cultures they you know they, they come from and there's lots of cultures in the world that do eat some of the animals that we consider as pets so it's not too far of a stretch to believe that maybe one there might be one yeah, incident. But I mean, if you look at where it really is happening, like, I mean, I've talked on the show about the Yulin Dog mm -hmm. Festival and stuff. I mean, it's it's primarily Southeast Asian cultures. And even yeah. then it's become a very fringe thing because people are, you know, st in those cultures are standing up against it and fighting against it and the yeah. dog meat trade. And the cat yeah they trade. see they see them it's as never pets, been right. a haitian thing like it's never <laughs> you know <laughs> like I've, I've eaten at my haitian friends houses a lot and they've never yeah. tried to you know never been worried it's <laughs> always been it's always been more so of a of a joke um when yeah, I mean, it was, growing up know, and stuff like that and having haitian friends like it's it's but, been more so of a joke but nothing that it, we've ever seen like as Americans, you know, do you, do you see that though as kind of being not kind of disingenuous, being, not just disingenuous, but cruel. I mean, to, to lie about people, you know, because you would never hear them make up a story like that about any specific group of white people. Right. Yeah. I mean, other I think, than uh, maybe Jewish people. My like pet's trying to eat troubles. me now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's turning the tables on you. <laughs> it's like, did someone say food? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just see it as very insidious and, and cruel. Like I know, um, you know, some, a lot of people in, not a lot, but there have been reports of, black people who've lived in Springfield, Ohio for decades mm -hmm. and decades, they're Americans and being they're now Haitians? being, what was that? Being called Haitians or. Well, they're, or they're having eating, people curse them out them? and yeah, threaten them and yell at them and call them names and being racist towards them, assuming, you know, oh, they must be Haitian because they're black. Yeah. Um, and even there was a Jamaican restaurant that got this really, angry you know crazed woman on the phone yelling at them because people aren't distinguishing between like okay jamaica is a different country from haiti or <laughs> haitia as jd vance called it <laughs> oh my like, that's that's funny that's a freudian slip type of thing yeah it's like yale law school really <laughs> he doesn't know haitian people come from Haiti, not Haitia. <laughs> oh, that's that's funny. I didn't uh, didn't hear about that, but yeah, I'm sure when it comes to he, like uh, he was doing our... like a I don't remember if it was an interview or a press conference, but yeah, he, he yeah <laughs> called when it, it when it comes to like <laughs> politics and and political leaders and campaigning. I think they just spend so much time by like, campaigning and speaking just subconsciously that uh we will see blurps from both sides of the aisle saying different things and stuff yeah. like that 
I agree. I agree. I, I, you know, the, the thing in Springfield really pissed me off though, you know, being that like my, my best friends are, mm -hmm. I consider them family, like yeah. anything they need day or night, middle of the night, if their lives were in danger, I would be there. I would load up my guns. <laughs> I would, I would be there. And they have been there for me at some of the worst times in my life. And yeah. for personally for JD Vance and Trump to put a bullseye on their back for no reason, like if, if, if there were actual reports, you know, verifiable, legitimate reports of yeah. people killing and eating animals. You know, my friend you know, uh, but... was talking with my friend about that actually. And, and he, he, he brings up that point that there are no verifiable reports so far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the police have confirmed it. The governor has confirmed it. Um, wildlife uh, facility or whatever it's called, wildlife organization that, that handles all, you know, issues. Actually, they were the ones that came forward and said that there was, you know, I don't know if you saw the picture of the man carrying the, the goose. Oh, yeah. I, I, I uh, heard about that. Yeah, didn't see so, the picture, I think, but I, I did hear about that. Okay, so I, I actually found it on Twitter and I, I shared a picture. I shared it on in one of my videos. But yeah, he was not in Springfield, Illinois, or, uh, Ohio. He was not Haitian and he was cleaning up roadkill. Uh, so they took that picture and just used it to incite. Run a story. Yeah, well, and to incite racism i mean and you know really where it came out where all this started from was a neo-nazi group oh wow so yeah there's a neo-nazi group that has been um, over in springfield and they've been doing their little rallies and and whatnot and i think it was maybe about a year ago um they were stopping cars and threatening people and like threatening to kill people and so yeah they're they're very proud of it like the the leader of their group came out and said yeah this is me i i did this and now they're passing out flyers in the area saying that you know calling they're doubling the down on it oh yeah and they're calling the haitian people um you know I, I don't remember the term they use but basically like vermin like trying to dehumanize them so yeah, to me it just not good no. it puts a target on every black person in this country because again racists aren't going to you know they're, yeah, they're not going to stop someone and and fig try to figure out are you haitian or are you you know they just see American. the color of someone's skin right yeah and it gives it gives them license to be disgusting and vile and hateful so uh, i would hope right i would like to believe that um you know the majority of the U.S. right is is not racist right and is you know that's you know coming from my side of the aisle is what we hear right we want to believe that most people you know as long as you're working hard you're good in my book right yeah and um you know it's to see these small pockets of vile hatred is, and 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 putting a spotlight on them I think sometimes emboldens them more mm -hmm. but you know sometimes we have to talk about it to prevent you know more it from spreading sometimes yeah i had an idea about maybe perhaps creating another department right how i mentioned before how departments have their own self-interest i want to make my mm -hmm. own department <laughs> i want to call it the uh, the department of discourse where <laughs> people from extremist ideologies whether they're communists or fascists or anarchists or whatever it may be can come together in a local institution a local place to just talk to each other and and maybe talk with federal or state you know moderators kind of like a discord except in real life and put out like a public service announcements like hey these are what these people are thinking today let's uh let's all come together and try to uh put our differences aside um because what we see is that a lot of that 
neo-Nazi stuff or a lot of the hate, hate groups, they're isolated from society, right? They're isolated mm -hmm. from, from having a, a discussion with, with people who are different than themselves. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's all on the internet, right? It's, it's literally coming from the internet. And if we can have more active like community involvement, even acknowledging their different ideas, hate, hate ideas and saying, hey, maybe you'll be open to not hating anymore. You know, if you come and socialize in person. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think families need to do more, too, with their kids, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, you see a lot of young men who are committing these violent crimes, like the one who, you know, tried to shoot and kill Donald Trump. And yeah, um, I, I just think parents don't often know what's going on with their kids. It's like they, they've just kind of checked out and don't realize how disengaged, how alone they feel. Mm. Um, so I think parents need to step up and do more, too. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that, um, you know, like, uh, I guess that goes align with one of the reasons why I went to the Capitol, which is I feel the nuclear family disintegrating. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think too, I mean, there, there's so many factors for that, but. Yeah, that, that know, we, mainly. We, we, we have the to echo look chambers. at financial reasons too. You know, well, I mean, yeah. when, when you have, you know, yes, some people, both parents want to work, you know, I, I would always, even if I, you know, when I had the opportunity to be a stay at, stay at home parent, I, I just am someone who likes to have my independence and I like to work and I like to have adult conversations, you know? Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's some people who choose to work, but even a lot of families that would like to have one of the parents stay home with the kids aren't able to afford it. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, you do end up with fragmented families and, you know, just no, no time to spend together and, so that's raise one of, children right to avoid lone wolves and these threats and these social ideological extremes yeah and I, I i see that as a dichotomy and and where republicans are kind of talking out of both sides of their mouth because they do espouse oh the nuclear family and we got to get back to that and you know, we got to get, you know, if women, they stay specifically staying home, taking care of the kids. I would argue, you know, it could be either one. Um, yeah. But then on the other hand, they don't want to enact the policies <laughs> that to are going to help with any of yeah. that. I can see so, that. Yeah, they, they just, they got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. <laughs> So that that's one of my biggest issues with the right. Um, I, I can see, I can see that. Yeah. 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 So anyway, well, I really appreciate the conversation. I, I hope that what people can take away from it is that we, we can find common ground, even when we're not on the same page and, you know, politically, um, you know, I've I've said on the show many times that my red line is bigotry. Like, if you are just a bigot against people because of the color of their skin or where mm -hmm. they come from or, you know, their their sexuality, like that's it for me. Like, I'm there. There is no more conversation because to me, that's just ignorance. It's like yeah. they're not hurting you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're they're not doing anything to you. They're just existing. And if you believe in God, then you believe that God makes everyone and everything. And so, yeah. you know, basically what you're saying is you think God makes mistakes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, to me, it's like, that's just ignorance. But um, yeah. yeah, I think it's when it's just policy differences and, you know, you can have reasonable conversations and, hey, what do you think about this? And what, you know, we can find common ground and yeah, maybe and, help um, people to think a little I, bit different i guess um um 
I had a conversation, a very short one, uh, with someone who was uh, a Vietnam war vet. And he Mm -hmm. said that, um, he, he said specifically, I thought, you know, we got rid of this communist ideology a long time ago, where he specifically mentioned, um, freedom of speech, where it used to be that on in, in campus, college campuses, uh, you can speak freely, right, about about whatever topics, and you can be on completely opposing sides of the field and not have a shouting match at each other, right? You can have a conversation. And, and when I look at, like, debates that are from the 90s or 80s, mm-hmm. uh, it looks like such a different platform like people were more willing and more open to talk without viciously attacking yeah i I hate to say it because i i know you're supporting him but you know (laughs) being that i am quite a bit older than you i i have watched it evolve and honestly i can say trump was the turning point in that and i know for myself i was not a political person like i would vote here and there, but I wasn't into politics. Like I, I now live it, breathe it, like every waking minute of my life pretty much yeah. is either reading something, watching something, <laughs> listening to podcasts, like it's uh, politics 24 <laughs> seven. Um, so I have done a complete 180 and that is 100% because of Donald Trump. Um, and I was even open to him at first. I watched The Apprentice. Mm-hmm. I bought into the whole, oh, he's a successful businessman. I didn't realize his dad had literally given him the equivalent of $400 million to get started. So pretty much anyone would look like Big a successful billion, you know, billionaire and, and wealthy businessman. Um, but yeah, what what did it for me was when he came down the elevator and said, you know, Mexico's not sending its best. They're sending rapists. They're sending drug dealers or saying, you know, and I'm like, again, putting a target on people, villainizing people who are just coming yeah. here for a better life. I mean, are there some people who are coming in who are not good people? Of course, yeah. that is always going to be the case. But the so rebuttal- many the rebuttal on on my side of the aisle for those statements was that he was specifically referring to like MS-13. Yeah, but he never said MS-13. Yeah. He said Mexico is not sending its best. That that yeah. was a generalized statement. Generalization about everybody who's coming across the border, and he's kept that up, you know. And then to see what he did, like with the child separation policy. Mm -hmm. how he purposely took children from even babies from their parents and some of them are lost forever and i don't even know like are you aware of that because i don't know if people on the right know that um i heard about that those stories um i forgot exactly what it was i believe the rebuttal from my echo chamber Mm -hmm. was that those were the same policies that were under the Obama era of immigration. Yeah. And he kept the same policies, I believe, when it, when it comes to the kids. Yeah, no. What Obama did was um, he, if, if there was no family relationship, they would try to figure out, like, you know, is this person taking someone else's child and smuggling them into the U.S. to traffic them or, you know, whatever, they would do their due diligence to try to figure that out. But if they were family, they kept them together. And, you know, everybody goes, oh, they're locking them in cages. Yes, Obama kept them, you know, in cages sometimes and in holding areas. But what Trump did, and this was, um, what's his name, Miller, I forget, there's two different Millers that that are involved yeah. with Trump, the, the bald one that looks like he could be a vampire. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, the, the most similar Jason sounding Miller name I'm then... thinking of is Millie, but i not too sure about Miller. Okay, yeah, it was, um, he is a, a known racist, this guy, like he ad- admits, you know, and, and what's funny is he's Jewish. 
So, but he came up with the whole idea that literally to separate the children from the parents, send them to separate facilities, even if they knew for a fact that they were related. And again, some of these were babies. Um, yeah. So that some of them were still I apologize. Um, do you hear any background noise or is it okay? I, I heard a little bit, yeah. You heard a little bit? Okay. And my wife is, uh, oh, maybe, yeah, she was in. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, they purposely separated them to act as a deterrent so that people would not come to the country. And yeah. I mean, it, it worked after a while because people were realizing, oh my God, they're literally taking Losing kids their kids away. Yeah. And these kids were sent, some of them were sent to like group homes. Some of them were sent to facilities. Some of them were sent into the foster care system. And Trump kept absolutely no record of who the parents were and which children went with them. So to mm -hmm. this day, there are literally hundreds of children who will never see their parents again. Those parents will never see their children. We have That's no sad, idea yeah. what happened to them. They could be in the hands of pedophiles right now. They could be in the hands of sex traffickers. There was no record kept. So even Trump's own people eventually, like uh, Kirsten, uh, what's her name? I forget her name, the blonde lady. Um, that was heading up that department, she even came out, some of them eventually came out and said that like, this is cruel. This is just abject cruelty. Like children were hysterical, crying. Yeah, seeing it know. firsthand is going to be a, a horrifying experience. Yeah. I mean, to, to know you're never going to see your child again, simply because you were trying to find a better life in a different country, or maybe even you were escaping you know, violence and gangs and, and threats in your own country. And then you come to America and now your child is lost forever. Because like I said, like some of them were so young, they couldn't even tell you who their parents were. They couldn't are. recognize who their yeah. parents were, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was heartbreaking because they reunited some families after Biden took office. And okay. um, actually the court stepped in and mandated that Trump start to reunite these parents because it was so cruel and they had a hard time doing it because like i said they weren't keeping track of any of this they literally just didn't care and so they started to reunite these kids with these parents and some of the kids were so young they literally didn't know their parents when they saw it because it had been a year two years and you know the parents were heartbroken because they're like oh my god my child and they're ready to embrace him and the kids like you know i don't i don't know you you know terrified of the stranger yeah so i mean it just the psychological damage it caused i mean this is why in my mind i think trump is evil i really do just the things that he's done things he's accused of doing I just think he's a danger. And now with what the Supreme Court did, basically saying, you're good, you won't be prosecuted for anything. I I just worry that it's going to get even worse. Yeah, I, I do so. pray and hope for the best. Um, and I, I do hope that uh, if Trump wins uh, another term, that you know, it'll be more balanced so that there'll be less of those horrifying experiences happening. I, I but, have to you tell know. you, it, it, the only thing that will happen is it will be worse. And I can pretty much guarantee that. I mean, if you go read Project 2025, the, the I've whole I've been hearing point, a lot about that, that term, yeah. Project 2025. Uh Still don't know what it is. I think it's supposed to be some agenda policy type of thing. Yeah, it was written by the most conservative, like, Christian group on the planet. So they want to get rid of birth control. They want to get rid of IVF treatment. They want to track women's uh, menstrual cycles. They want to track women's pregnancies. Um, Jason Miller, which is the other Miller, he was just on TV the other day and he was asked about this tracking pregnancy. And he was like, yeah, I mean, if the states want to do it, then that's what we're going to do in the next Trump term to prevent abortion. 
we will just keep track of women's pregnancies to make sure that they don't escape. That's a bit of a state. violation of the Fourth Amendment. Well, I mean, it's it's completely surreal. I mean, people talk about communism. I mean, this is like <laughs> this is like dystopian, you know? Yeah, that's that's um, more fascism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's things like that there. I mean, they everything is about religion and just pushing it on people. But, you know, pushing Christianity and it's like, OK, where's the freedom in that? I mean, we have Jewish people. We have Muslims in this country. We have yeah. Buddhists. We have. Yeah, what you know, I would say you know, is that that when it comes to like the Bible or when it comes to Jesus and being me being a firm believer in, in Christ. He gives us the option to walk away from him. And if you want to be a different religion, if you want to worship what they would call in the Bible, the mystery religions, he allowed you to go away and and, and like do your own thing. But at the consequence of not being associated with Jesus, you know, and and I think our nation really espoused that sort of freedom that Christ gave to us. Uh, the nation gives to its citizens where you can be whoever you want to be. You can be a Satanist if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, we're mean, not going to, you know, our constitution. Exactly. You know? So, right. yeah, I mean, everything in Project 25 is basically just the opposite of what our constitution says in giving us freedom to do what we want. And, yeah, I'm not liking that idea. I did hear. Yeah. I apologize for interrupting again. Sure. Um, I did hear that allegedly Trump said he didn't uh, want to associate with Project 2025 or something like that. Yeah, well, he doesn't want to associate with it because now it, it polls extremely low, even with Republicans, even with religious conservatives. Um, but yeah, the the founders, of, you know, the, the authors and creators of Project 25 they have been caught on tape. One of them was recorded saying, oh, yeah, Trump just says that, but he's totally on board with us. He's given us his approval. Um, and all of the people mm. involved with it are people who worked in his first administration or worked on his campaign. I mean, he is absolute. J.D. Vance wrote the foreword for it. <laughs> so for them to try to like moonwalk away from it now is like eh, it's a little too late. Um, I'm gonna but, I'm gonna do more digging into it because that yeah. that sounds concerning and it it sounds not not like freedom. No, I mean they want across the board no abortion, no exceptions, um, not even for rape or incest, not for the life of the mother. They want. Um, yeah, I draw the line at life of the mother. That's personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, you know, I, having family members, a child who's been violently raped, I can tell you just the trauma from that alone and wanting to kill themselves. If that is not allowed, I mean, I'll lose my mind. I'll, you know, I, I'll push my kid down the stairs <laughs> before I let them go through another trauma like that. <laughs> just um, the but, the yeah. argument um about about that the the raping part um that that i hear from one of one of the pages i follow on instagram was that it it the trauma comes from the abortion and not from raising the child of the abuser it's the yeah, argument no. i'm hearing from from that no. instagram I, page I, mean, that, I follow that child is a daily reminder of the violence of being you're you're being forced against your will to allow a man to enter your body yeah that's no uh, i mean and then you're going to be forced against your will to carry the product of that violence and they make the argument that the abuser should face life in prison but the no, unborn child should shouldn't suffer yeah I think they should be castrated. So, I think anybody yeah. who sexually assaults a, a woman, a child, a boy, absolutely should be castrated. Yeah. And I know a lot of progressives would be like, oh, don't say, you know, but no, <laughs> sorry. I'm also for the no, death penalty. A lot of people on you, our side 
yeah. agree with you on that. Yeah, if you're caught in the act of of harming a child or an animal or so, you know, and is like absolutely 100% you did it, sorry, you you should not be on this earth. You are a danger yeah. to society. So yeah, that's where I I cross the line from progressive into a more conservative territory, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look into Project 2025 because it is seriously dystopian, crazy shit. Like it's it's bad. It's really bad. Yeah, Um, there's like a episode of bad uh, of Black Mirror come to life. Yeah, it really is. And the people who drafted it are horrific. Like I just did a show the other day. One of the main architects of Project 2025. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but it, you can you can find the vi- the video on my channel. He went. He told people that he murdered his neighbor's dog, beat it to death with a shovel, and he was like bragging about this. And That's it's a little. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, and they went and talked to the neighbor because this supposedly happened, you know, years ago. And the neighbor was like, yeah, our dog just vanished. Like right around that time that you're talking about, we never knew what happened to her. We just thought she got out and she never came back. And we looked for her. We went to the pound, couldn't find her. And yeah, he, he was, the, the guy was a um, college professor at the time. And he was telling other colleagues at work, some over dinner at his house, about this story. He's like, yeah, you know, we had a baby and the dog was barking and it was keeping us up and waking up the baby. And I just like, you know, couldn't take it anymore and went over yeah, there with a went shovel. So far and... as to kill a dog. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, and when you tell a story to multiple people, it's like, yeah. you're not ashamed of it. You clearly think that you were in the right. So yeah. just psycho people. Um, Then it just came out the other day, which I'm planning to do a story on it uh, probably tomorrow. Another one of the guys who's involved in Project 2025, totally, you know, anti-LGBTQ, it just came out. He was doing um, gay porn just like 10 years ago. (laughs) It's like, you guys are a bunch of freaking hypocrites. It it definitely, that is something I do see um when it comes to hypocrisy right like um i remember when there was a photo of mike pence uh bearing some feminine attire i believe and uh it was you know i think kyle kalinsky made a video on it way long time ago yeah and it's it's like no lgbtq stuff you know like Mm -hmm. I would say per the Bible, right? But then, you know, have let's say Mike Pence repented so and so forth for for wearing feminine clothing or participating in homosexual activities or something like that, right? Then he can come to Christ. But it does look very hypocritical. Yeah. Yeah. Or Madison Cawthorn was caught in drag. I mean, A bunch of them, you know, and you've got Matt Schlapp, who founded CPAC. I mean, he's now been accused of of assaulting several men, you know, one that said he pummeled his junk um, after an event when he was driving him back to his hotel. I mean, yeah, (laughs) it's like. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) no. So the world of politics and religion. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, this whole, this whole project 2025 thing is really horrific. And what the reason I brought it up was because you were saying you were hoping that the next Trump administration would be better. The whole basis of project 2025, one of the main things, the whole underpinning and how they plan to get their insane extremist policies through is they plan to go through and just clear the field of any um, government officials who do not fall not in line. line. Yeah. Right. So even I'm, people I think I'm who... going to oh, go ahead. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. I was going to say, you know, like not people who 
um, there, there's a rule, I can't remember the rule that it is, but there's people who just work for the government throughout all administrations. So they are just government employees. They're not like elected. They're not, you know, put into place by Congress. These are just people who are careerists. They, you know, this is just what they do. They serve Democrats. They serve Republicans. They are nonpartisan, you know, or they're supposed to be. And so they are going to do away with that rule so that Donald Trump can put 100% loyalists in place so that he can do whatever he wants. I, uh, so. I'm going to hope that what you're telling me is really far-fetched and not plausible. You know, I'm going to hope and pray for it. I think I'm also going to follow up with you on it because that that's concerning for me. You know, I want Trump yeah. to win and I, I don't want to see some sort of fascist ideology going around. Yeah. So I'm going to reach back yeah. with you on that one for sure. Yeah, go look. They have they have it up on their website. It's a big document. It's like 900 pages, but um, it's out there and they, they don't deny writing it. You know, they just deny that, oh, yeah, this is just, you know, our ideas and we're just giving Trump ideas. But yeah, what I he's... like to do for like, I apologize again for interrupting. Sure. Um, I like to use chat GPT to get like a nonpartisan viewpoint. Because I think it does a really good, like, job when I ask a question. Yeah, so... I don't know. I typed myself in one time, <laughs> and it was so wrong. <laughs> you know, I, I, when... I asked my name. I actually got it. Yeah. I, I, I liked it. I think it was accurate. Okay, here, here's how off mine was. Because I thought, okay, I'm going to put in mine. I figured it would bring up my book, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I wrote a book years ago about my vegan experience and health and what causes disease and all that stuff and it, you know and i've i've been a speaker at various vegan events i've been on different shows um so i thought that's what it would bring up because you know my show this was probably about a year or two maybe close to two years ago yeah. i figured maybe it's not picking up on my show that much had no results and then so i typed in uh gina banano limos raw news and politics and it said that I'm a conservative show host or something or conservative. <laughs> I'm like, how uh, on that's... earth do you Did get you try that it again conservative? Recently? I haven't done it recently now, but <laughs> it's like, really? Okay, this thing is not ready for prime time. <laughs> okay, here it is. It might be ready now. It says, is a certified holistic nutritionist, author, and speaker who focuses on plant-based nutrition and veganism. And a couple more sentences. Okay. Well, they got some of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotten better. <laughs> yeah. It didn't bring up raw news yet, but it'll yeah. get there. <laughs> Lisa's not calling me conservative anymore. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> uh, maybe... Uh, uh, maybe you recognize that you hit, you sent me a, a a DM through Instagram or vice versa. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it was like, oh, she's pro death penalty. She must be conservative. <laughs> oh, okay. That that could be it too. That could be it too. Yeah, I don't. I don't even think that because I don't even know if I've talked about that on my show until now. I don't know. So, These phones pick know. up everything we we speak and say now. Yeah, so. yeah. I am a gun owner, so I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. More common ground. Yep. Yep. See, so not all of us progressives are. Yeah, I crazy. I uh, as a progressive, like when I was, I still believed in gun rights. I just thought that, you know, background checks were a good thing and that yeah. gun registration is harmless. And, but now, you know, I could have a whole nother conversation about it. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely believe in red flag laws, having grown up with a psychotic father who should yeah. have been locked up and threatened to shoot us in our sleep. Um, and we had that is horrifying. Guns. Yeah. I apologize you had to go through that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, di didn't sleep well as a child, as you would imagine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that women should be, you know, protected from abusive spouses if you've been you know, hauled off for, for being abusive, you should not be 
hey, you should not have access to a gun. You know, I mean, it's statistically. Yeah, I think uh, Trump actually championed uh, red flag laws. He said, "We'll we'll get it. We'll get him first, and we'll get him quick." I You think know, is what he said. That he, I was like, he "Oh, may have said interesting." that, but one of the first things he did, and you can look it up, one of the first things he did when he got into office was he made it easier for people with mental illness to get guns. That was one of the first executive orders that he signed. So, yeah, he talks out of both sides of his mouth quite a bit. <laughs> Okay, he okay. says the right things, but if you look at what he actually did, no bueno. <laughs> No bueno. Uh, Yeah, there's, oh, we could literally go on for hours yeah, talking about our different yeah, uh, opinions on things and and coming to new conclusions every day. yeah, yeah, yep, yep, <laughs> so we'll have to do it again sometime, I'm gonna have to record some other shows, I gotta do a recap on the, the uh, vice presidential debate that happened Oh, last yes. night, so, Well, they had a they had a the vice presidential debate happened last night. Right, right. Yeah, that will be the only one. So they, they didn't agree to do any more. So unfortunately, that seems to be it because Trump won't do another one with Kamala. So. Yeah, that's I think another one would be oh, we would have to talk about now that the earpiece thing. What about that earpiece in Kamala's ear? What Yeah, what that, was that that all about? was proven fake. That was proven fake. It was. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, she just prepared. She just really prepared. And, you know, it's easy to get under his skin. He's just a very insecure man who, you know, has mommy and daddy issues. So, <laughs> sadly. I, I thank you, Gina, for, uh, you know, allowing me to be on your show and you know, we had a great time, I, I believe. Yeah, yeah, no, I enjoyed the conversation. I'm glad people got to meet you and, you know, get to, to hear A different side and um, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you if they want to find because you're starting to do some political stuff Yeah. and you got some Um, music um, out there yeah, so I'm currently trying to promote my latest single. It's about uh, narcissism, uh, specifically narcissism in hip hop as a genre as a whole. It's a song. It's called NPD song, like narcissistic personality disorder song. And the goal of it was to be almost satirical. Um, it's sounds like every other rap song and it, it speaks about narcissism i think it becomes apparent very apparent in the chorus of the Okay. song um Yeah, and, so and I'm I must say, you, mm um, I will tell the audience, you know, uh, you sent me some of your music and you're very talented. I, and I, I'm thank not you just saying that people know me, they know if I didn't mean that, I wouldn't bring it up at all. So <laughs> I, I mean that thank sincerely. you You're a very talented rapper um, and I am into rap music. So it, it's, it's my thing. It's my jam. But uh, Thank you, Gina. <laughs> appreciate that. I personally, I have to say this, I, I can't promote it because <laughs> I just don't want to promote anything with the N word in it. yeah, That yeah, of to course. me is like, like, yeah, that's a word I just don't say. So <laughs> it's It's a just whole not other field my in, thing. in the industry. Yeah, yeah. But it was, it was really good. I mean, I it's honestly good. Thank you. So, yeah. Um. So my Instagram is at real f money that's r-e-a-l f money and then um my website real f money.com and then right here on youtube if you type in f money and maybe npd song you'll find my youtube channel Awesome. Awesome. And you know, what's funny is I have friends that call me G money. ah uh, g money okay i might start calling you that now uh, gina Yeah. g money <laughs> yeah that's funny Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So F money and G money, we're going to peace out. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a good uh, evening because you're over on the East coast. I'm still in the middle of my afternoon. Uh, yeah So <laughs> yeah. I thank you I hope you have a amazing afternoon and and productive workflow Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And yeah, we'll we'll thank talk you again. Look into that project 2025. Hit me up on Instagram. will do will do All right. thank Thanks, you Gina Felipe. Appreciate you you being open and, and coming on the show and being willing to to talk about your your thoughts. Thank you and for the opportunity again.